Hello, so in this video, I'm going to talk about Alistair Norcross's essay, Puppies, Pigs, and People Eating Meat in Marginal Cases. And so his argument is basically saying that the good that comes from eating meat is disproportionate with the pernicious, awful suffering that animals experience when they are confined and killed on factory farms. So we have to treat animals and marginal humans, so humans who don't necessarily have the um, cognitive abilities like rationality or self-consciousness, we have to treat these animals and marginal humans as equals since some humans might have mental lives that may not that may be equivalent to a non-human animal but at the same time we don't think it's okay to eat a human right so why do we think it's okay to eat an animal and he basically categorizes humans most humans at least as moral agents where we can think ethically we can make decisions we can have moral reasoning whereas moral patients are those who may lack the cognitive powers needed to be a moral agent but at the same time we have duties we as moral agents have duties to these moral patients so just because they lack these cognitive powers doesn't make it okay to torture and kill them so in order to understand how we can think about the factory farming industry and how eating animals that come from the factory farming in industry is unethical the author discusses this guy named Fred, who's a puppy torturer. Fred's a terrible guy, but unfortunately what happened to him is that he had a car accident, he suffered head trauma, and it severely uh, ruined his Godiva, Godiva gland, which secretes cocoa hormone, and this cocoa hormone enables him to really enjoy chocolate. And so unfortunately, puppies' brains in this hypothetical scenario have a high concentration of cocoa hormone. So um, if you stimulate that part of their brain, right, then they can give cocoa hormone and that's how Fred can enjoy chocolate. But you have to basically torture um, the puppy in order for this cocoa hormone secretion to happen, right? So it doesn't just come from petting a, do a dog, right? They have to be tortured and, and experience stress. So Fred then doesn't derive pleasure from torturing the puppies, but he really wants to be able to have this gustatory pleasure of eating chocolate. He actually sympathizes with the puppies. But many of us would say no decent person would contemplate torturing puppies, but we do that to other animals for purely gustatory pleasures. And Norcross is saying that billions of animals endure intense suffering just for gustatory pleasure. Most people would be okay if they did it, if they stopped eating meat. There's plenty of uh, other protein options from beans and now fake meats that are coming out. So we don't be okay. It's not a necessity for our health, at least for most of our most of us. So we're mainly then torturing, we as a society or people who eat meat then, are mainly torturing animals for purely gustatory pleasure, right? In the factory farming industry, um, the chicken that people eat, the veal, the beef, the pork that people eat comes from intensive confinement facilities where the, these animals are experiencing severe stress, they're tortured, they also experience anesthetized mutilations. And so <clears throat> because of how terrible the situation is, Norcross is basically saying that we should condemn those who support the factory farming industry by eating it. So you don't have to directly torture an animal to be morally culpable for the harms that happen in the factory farming industry if you're eating it, right? We basically pay with our dollars and we vote by our dollars in society. So if we are eating meat, then we are increasing the demand of that uh, from the factory farming industry. So Norcross then gives three typical arguments that are used for continuing to eat meat from the factory farming industry. And then he also provides counter arguments to go with each argument. So the first one that's typically said a lot is, well, just because I personally give up eating meat from the factory farming industry, doesn't really make a difference, right? I'm just one person, agribusiness is huge, factory farming industry is huge, right? So like, why is it all on me, especially when me making this choice doesn't really have an impact, right? I alone can't prevent the suffering of animals. And um, <clears throat> Norcross's argument is saying, well, just because humans enjoy eating this doesn't justify the suffering of these animals. Um, and so the counter argument is, is to say that, well, let's say you had a friend who was eating chocolate mousse that comes from freshly slaughtered puppies. A morally decent person would not want to eat that chocolate mousse. They would feel really unethical about it. Um, so just because we personally don't feel like we can make a difference doesn't mean it's still morally okay to eat something or consume something that comes from torture. So. Even he, he says though, we still can make a difference, right? If it's just everyone thinking that they can't make a difference and they won't make a difference. But if you have, you know, 10,000 people, for example, who give up eating chicken, then that's a quarter of a million fewer chickens that are bred each year. 
So it does make a difference, but by thinking it's not going to make a difference continues and perpetuates that idea that we can't do anything. So of course, yeah, you as an individual may not be able to completely stop the factory farming industry, but no morally decent person would be able to continue to eat for example, that chocolate mousse that came from the tortured puppy in the same way that no morally decent person would feel okay eating chicken that came from a tortured chicken or beef that came from a tortured cow. So that's the first argument and then the counter argument. Now, the second argument is basically saying that while Fred in intentionally hurts puppies, whereas I don't intentionally want the factory farm raised animals to suffer, right? But um, what we see is that animal suffering is a side effect of the factory farming industry. And so this is where we um, can apply this to the doctrine of the double effect, where an action is morally permissible if the good that comes from it outweighs the bad. But Norcross is saying the good that comes from the factory farming industry, which is the gustatory pleasure of eating meat, does not outweigh the bad, the torture, the suffering, right, that inflicts these animals. So that's why this intentionality doesn't really matter here. The double effect cannot really work here because the bad outweighs the good. The third argument that's typically given is that, well, puppies and dogs count morally, whereas other animals don't. Well, what gives puppies higher moral status, right? Some people might say, oh, well, they're cuter. I have a relationship with them. They're, they're more loyal. Maybe they're more devoted. But... If most puppies have this, most farm animals can also have this. So would it be okay to torture puppies if they were stupid, if we weren't connected with them in terms of having them as pets? No, right? So Norcross is basically saying there really aren't any morally relevant differences between Fred the puppy torturer and millions of people who eat factory raised meat, right? It's very ethically and morally inconsistent. So at the end of the essay then, he says, okay, now that we have these counter arguments to think about, um, what about marginal cases? Because most people would say that they don't feel comfortable eating human beings who may not have rational abilities, but they are okay eating animals, like non-human animals. What's the distinction there? So some humans lack what makes humans supposedly have a superior moral status, rationality, um, self-consciousness, the ability to reflect, the ability to plan long-term. And so if we think about this though, like some human beings don't have the, don't have moral reflection. So infants, for example, um, some people who are cognitively disabled or who are in a vegetative state, right? So not all humans have these abilities that supposedly make human superior, but at the same time, then people say, well, that's an exceptional situation. But if we're talking about generalizations here and we're saying that it's okay to kill um, and, you know, entire species and torture an entire species for a gustatory pleasure based off of a quality that not every human has, that doesn't make any sense then, right? So marginal humans don't, uh, they aren't just a particular situation when you're using certain qualities to justify torturing animals, non-human animals. So why is it that a particular feature or set of features is not morally relevant when you're using those set of features to distinguish humans from non-animals, right? It's ethically and morally and logically inconsistent. So just because there, there can be natural differences that exist between humans and animals doesn't mean that it's okay to make one attribute or difference and view it as morally superior or morally inferior, right? So many non-human animals have abilities that we as human beings don't have, but it's kind of our bias to say that, well, our quality of rationality is superior, right? It doesn't make, it's not a valid argument. It's not objective at all. So basically Norcross is concluding and saying, Animals are moral patients, just like some humans are moral patients, right? Where they don't have necessarily the abilities to make moral choices. And human beings are moral agents and moral patients. So we as humans are subject to moral obligations uh, to make sure that we aren't contributing to the torture and unnecessary torture of non-human animals. So basically, you know, with greater responsibilities, or sorry, with greater abilities comes greater responsibilities, right? It doesn't just exist in a vacuum. And this is why we ought to not eat animals that come from the factory farming industry since they're tortured and undergo so much stress that's unnecessary.